Welcome to my presentation on Zeek BACnet Basics. My name is Keith Jones. There is my website, just drkeithjones.com. If you want to discuss this topic or any other cybersecurity topic more, uh, you can get to me with any of those links to my different social media accounts. All right, so what can I tell you about BACnet? BACnet, it stands for Building Automation and Control Networks. And you can think of it as a protocol. So building devices talk to other building devices. Um, and what do I mean by devices? Probably the most well-known type of device is going to be your HVAC device, like your heating air conditioning unit. Now, for the purposes of this presentation and demo, uh, there is a PCAP out there. I gave you the link there. It's public. You can download it. I'm going to use the one that's titled backnet-services.cap. Another piece of information you may want to know is backnet, its default port is 47808 UDP. Now, it can be on other ports. Um, that's not the only port it can be on. It's the one I see it the most often on, but I have seen it on other ports that it's not, that's not the default port of 47808. So when we start talking about these BACnet objects on a BACnet network, we need some way to address them to say, you know, this is device A, this is device B, this is device C. And they're addressed by a few different things. Since we're going to be in the Zeek world, we're going to start talking about IP addresses and ports. So in this case, it's going to be the IP address. If someone's talking to a BACnet device, it's going to be the destination IP address and port or the RESP, R-E-S-P in Zeek terms. So that will tell us what BACnet network a device could be on because in the IP world, um, networks are segregated by the pair of IP address and port. So you could have a firewall out there that on port 47808 routes packets to BACnet network A, and then on 47809, then routes packets to the BACnet network B and so forth. And that's how I've seen organizations keep their BACnet networks separate is by using different IP address port combinations. Now, once you're on a BACnet network, there's two pieces of information you need to know to get to a BACnet object. One is the object type. And an object type, it could be a bunch of different things. Uh, it could be the word device. It could be the word analog input. Um, binary input, um, I think binary output, I think there's an analog output and so forth. These are just different um, enums of the type of the object, object type, BACnet object type. So now the last little piece of information we need to know is just the integer of the instance type or the instance number. So when, once you already know a BACnet network, you can then address an object by just knowing the object type and the instance number. So it could be device 104, or it could be binary output 608, something along those lines. Now in BACnet, there's this who is discovery protocol that happens, and it's kind of like your ARP that you probably know, and there's a lot of who is, I am, and I haves. And the purpose of this protocol is to map that IP address and port to the BACnet object type instance number pair. And I'm going to show you examples of that in some logs, in some Zeek logs coming up. Now, another thing you need to know is every BACnet device has properties. I guess technically... a and um, I said the word device, I guess it would be object, but I guess technically an object could have zero properties, but typically I see properties on every object that I've seen on, on live networks. The big thing is other hosts by default can read and write 
device properties without any type of security, which is a dangerous thing. Now there's some several actions on the BACnet network that you should be aware of. And I put them in green and red at the bottom of the slide here. Uh, basically the green is I'm showing you in BACnet terms, there might be a read property request. And then the object will then acknowledge it and give you the uh, value of that property. So it would be read property act and it would give you the value with that. You can do it multiple um, properties at a time. And that's the second green line there where you have the multiple request and the multiple act. And then you have a write property, which is in red on the bottom line there. And there isn't the same thing. There isn't an act that comes back in the same way that there is with a read. So when it gets fired off, you don't necessarily know if it's successful or not, unless you see that value pop up when someone, either you or someone else reads that property. So a few more basics. <clears throat> so most times, um, a, an object will have an object type of device. And what that means is a physical device, uh, uh, at least of what a human thinks a device is. And the reason why I say that is because every BACnet object has an instance number on the network. So an HVAC device that you might put on your network might have 16 sensors in it. And each of those 16 sensors will look like other BACnet objects on your network. So it gets real confusing on how things are related to each other on the BACnet network. Now there's this query that can happen for the property called object list. And if we were to query a device, if we knew a device and we said, what is your object list? That device will come back and say, okay, well, I have this sensor. You know, it might be a analog input number one. This other sensor is a binary input number two and so forth. And then it'll go through the outputs and so forth. So this is a way that at least on Zeek network monitoring level, we can sort of see parent child relationships between the BACnet device and the sensors and other objects inside those devices. So for instance, in the graph that I have on the bottom, you could have device one, which might be the HVAC device in the square and the analog input 101, which might be like a temp se temperature sensor. That would be a different object on the BACnet network. So those would be two different addressable devices on the BACnet network. There'd be device one, which is the square, and then there'd be analog input 101, which would be the temperature sensor inside that HVAC physical device. Now, we talked a little bit about what is BACnet from a, um, you know, just a generic standpoint. So now we're going to talk about what does BACnet look like from a Zeek standpoint? So in order to look at BACnet in Zeek, you want to install the CISA Zeek package. And I put the link for you there. It's uh, usually the first link on Google when you just type CISA Zeek BACnet. It goes to that GitHub account. When you install this, there's three new logs in here. And... I use them to varying degrees, depending on what it is I'm doing. Um, so the very first log is called backnet.log. And that basically logs each message type in the return code. And I'm going to show you examples of all three of these logs in a second. So just kind of listen to me talk about them generically for a second. The backnet.log isn't, I don't use that as much in most of my research. It just kind of tells you that a communication happened, but it doesn't really have a lot about the content about what happened. Now the second log is the BACnet discovery log. And this is the log that logs the who is, I am's, I have's, and so forth that start linking IP addresses and ports to 
um, BACnet, object type, and instance numbers. I use it some. You know, when I'm trying to understand maybe network topology, I'll look at this log and it lets me know behind what IP addresses I can expect certain BACnet devices. The big log I look most at is the BACnet property log. And this is a log that contains all the reads and writes for all these different BACnet properties. So remember how I showed you, um, I said every BACnet device has a list of properties and they can um, go through and read those list of properties. You can also go through and write those list of properties. When that happens, it's saved in this log, the BACnet property.log. So if we were to take Zeek, install this package, and assuming that it's tied in so that we can just call it through packages, um, if we run this command, zeek-cr backnet services.cap packages, we're going to get three new logs. So the first one, backnet.log, looks like this. And I'm not going to talk a ton about it. You're going to see that there are just read properties, write properties, and so forth. So from sort of a backnet PDU level, you see what's going on, if it's successful or not, but you don't know what was asked, what was returned, or anything along those lines. Backnet discovery.log. Now here it gets a little more interesting because here I'm showing you some examples where in the first couple of lines you'll see who is, and it will say, ah, oh, who is such and such? And then, which is... Um, if I can squint from way back here, 108. So who is 108? And you can see that there's an answer. It says, I am 108. And it has the IP address and it includes a little bit of vendor information. So you can see it's uh, Acuity Brands Lighting Inc. And this is the first four lines up there at the top of the Zeke log. Not the header, but the actual data, the first four lines. Now... That's not a one-off, as you see with my red box down the right-hand side, that Acuity Brands Lighting is, it shows up in other things. So this vendor information is just populated. We didn't even ask for it. It's just populated in, in the BACnet discovery logs, which from a security standpoint is a good and a bad thing. Good from, we can start, um, making an inventory and understanding what's on our network, but bad because if anybody else sees this information, they know exactly what we have on our network. Now, the third log is the backnet property dot log. And here's an example. And you can see this is the top of the log just because I wanted to show you the top with the header and stuff, but you can see that there's a bunch of read property requests or some multiples, and there's just some singles in there. And then there is a write property. It looks like on lines three and four of the data, not the header, but the data. But here, if we scroll down a little bit, I wanted to show you that device 29, which is one of the main devices in this PCAP file that I pointed to or pointed you to earlier, Device 29 starts, well, it's requested its object list. And then it iterates through all the indexes or the indice numbers in the object list. And there's a request and there's ACK. And you can see that it goes through and it requests, you know, what is this index? And then it comes back with whatever it is. So for instance, index two comes back with analog input 101. So if I can break one of these lines down for you, it's basically saying device 29 has a sensor with whatever name it is on the right-hand side. So analog output, I guess that wouldn't be a sensor, that would be an output, but analog output 101 would be one example. Binary output 101 would be another example. And you can see there's just a whole bunch of outputs going down the right-hand side of your screen here. So all these are within one device on this BACnet network in this PCAP, this public PCAP that you can look at with me. 
Now you can see I also outlined some more uh, useful information. Here's a couple lines where it requested the vendor name and it gave back uh, device 29 is Lithuania Lighting Inc. So useful information. Also requested what's your model name? And it says I'm a Sys CMLX for whatever that means in Lithuania Lighting Inc. speak. We look at some more examples here. I highlighted one at the top where it asks, uh, what's your object name? And it says, I'm Dimmer 101. So even if we don't know anything else, we know just by the human name that it's probably a dimmer. It's probably like some kind of light switch dimmer. Right now it's analog output present value is um, zero, which probably means it's off. If I had to guess, I imagine a positive is turned on and zero is off. If we scroll down a little bit, it asks what units are you? And it has percent. So I guess it would be zero, probably zero through a hundred percent. So just about halfway down your page there, you see the units. That's where I'm getting that from. And then the last red box at the bottom, um, it asks what's your description. And this is another one of those human things that get put into um, the device when they get set up. And this says it's S2W104 High Bay N1. And that probably means something to the person that set up this BACnet network. It probably is some geographical location in some kind of bay somewhere where somebody looking at this number would know where to go to find it. So the last thing I want to show you with BACnet is what does this look like in Wireshark? And if you thought Zeke looked complex and like a lot of data, Wireshark's probably worse because you have to go through every packet and kind of discern and pick things apart and then go look for the replies and so forth. So if you wanted to, you can open this PCAP up in Wireshark and have a field day with it. But um, even if you just kind of skim down the right-hand side there with all the the reads and the atomic files and this and that. It just gets really complex really fast. And this is not even that complex of a, a PCAP to be looking at. So when you run it through Zeek and you have those three log files that pop out in sort of the 60,000 foot, 30,000 foot and 10,000 foot views, it lets you make sense of your environment a lot faster than if I were for me, if I were to have to pick it apart in Wireshark. So with that, again, I'll draw you to my uh, website, drkeithjones.com. If you're interested in, in um, contacting me on social media, if you want to ask questions about this or um, want to see videos on other topics, feel free to hit me up. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you on one of our next videos. Thanks.